So this is November uh, 24th, and um, I think that for, for many of us who are witnessing the horrors of um, what we are witnessing from thanks to journalists in Gaza, um, I think like, like so many of you, I have also felt the horror and the shock of, of what has been going on. Um, one of the images that stick out in my mind from the very beginning is a young child shivering from shock. Uh, and I think the images speak for themselves. Uh, we all have watched helplessly as, um, as we see this, this war or this conflict, whatever people want to call it, the semantics I think are irrelevant in, in this case that people are dying. Um, there's a new acronym that has now cr created from this war, which is WCNSF, which is Wounded Child, No Surviving Family. 80% of Palestinians in Gaza are uh, displaced. That's something like 1.7 million people. And they ha some have no home to return to. Under international human rights law, all human rights are universal, indivisible, and interdependent and interrelated. The international community must treat human rights globally in a fair and equal manner, on the same footing and with the same emphasis. However, we are seeing the rise of authoritarianism through the censorship of freedom of speech by those who do not believe in the universality of human rights. It always amazes me as well that when the world community speaks of genocide or apartheid or colonialism, they do not think of what has happened in, on Turtle Island and in the Americas. Those of us who are indigenous are multi-generational survivors, and I think we, it's safe to say that um, we can see the parallels of the, the plight uh, of Palestinian people uh, with ours. Some people on social media have commented that this is not an indigenous people's fight. Those are people who do not know what human rights stands for. They do not know their ancestral teachings that make all life precious. Indigenous people understand oppression and we recognize when a genocide is happening. We understand the impacts of multi-generational trauma from apartheid, from genocide. And we, we know only too well the playbook of the oppressor the PR that goes on to dehumanize all people, mostly the poor, um, in order so that they can push forward their economic agendas. We as Indigenous people are expressing tonight our solidarity with Palestinians who have for the past, I don't know, 50 days or so, have had no safe place to shelter. They are told to go somewhere to shelter and it's safer and then get bombed. This is unacceptable. We as human beings need to stand up. We cannot remain silent. We must express our hopes for a lasting peace. We must express our solidarity with other human beings, with all the peoples of Mother Earth who understand that the actions and decisions we make today will impact seven generations from now. We must end the genocide in Gaza, lift the siege on food, water, and medical supplies, and have a permanent ceasefire. It is a reasonable demand, one of which, which, which follows international human rights law, which has been flagrant, flagrantly defied by all state actors. Let the people of Gaza return home to rebuild, bury their dead and grieve in peace. We have with us tonight some very extraordinary people. Um, and before I introduce them, I just want to thank um, E.J. Miller Larson who is the artist of the poster for this particular webinar. We'd like to thank all the panelists who are making time from their busy days to be with us. We have with us, who will be the first speaker, is my Sam Ghani of the Palestinian Youth Movement. We also have Gabor Mate, who is a Canadian physician, retired, public speaker, and a best-selling author of five books. We have with us as well, Abby Lewis, who is a documentary filmmaker and former TV journalist who teaches climate justice at UBC and is a proud member of Independent Jewish Voices. We also have with us 
Samir Shaheen Hussein and my cat who is meowing, <laughs> who is a pediatrician uh, and emergency physician, associate professor in pediatrics and member of the Caring for Justice, uh, Social Justice Collective and author of the award-winning Fighting for a Hand to Hold. We also have with us uh, from my community, and a great pleasure to have him and welcome him with us, Clifton Nicholas, who is a filmmaker and activist from Ganesadag and Ganyagahaga homelands. Uh, my name is Ellen Gabriel, Gajitzakwas, with Gunawaradu Sawabwebu, Gajitzak. Waganyahtu, Tano Ganesadag, Aganagare, Mahadu Adadawada Sawa, Wagadunzoni, G. De Tinawaradu Nana Yakini Stanghutza, De Tinawaradu Nagwebu Nagatsitstansras Oyera, and De Tinawaradu Nana Sanguayat Ditsu, De Nagwebu 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 so my name is Gatit Zagwas and I'm Turtle Clan from uh, the community of Ganesadage, some of you know as Oka. We also experienced 33 years ago um, a siege of our community where our fundamental human rights were denied. Um, and so with that, uh, I would like to say we welcome uh, all of you here tonight. Uh, I had said in my, my language um, that we welcome all the, and our gratitude to the natural life forces, to the creator, uh, and to all of that that nourishes and gives us life. And we're thankful for another day. Our first speaker tonight will be Mays Ghani from the Palestinian Youth Movement. And um, we have uh, a, f a formula for um, telling you when your time is up. I'll raise my hand. Uh, Mays, I think you missed that part. Uh, so with that, I will let Mays uh, continue this webinar. Thank you so much, Yoko. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, I just want to check that folks can hear me okay. Audio is good. Beautiful. Um, salam. Uh, my name is Naysam. Uh, I'm joining from the Palestinian Youth Movement uh, based in Tagaranto. Uh, I'm honored to be here as I've, and to be here with all of you. I've looked to the resistance of the Ganyan Gehaga um, of Ganawage and Ganasag. Ganesatage for some time now. And so I'm very, very honored to be here um, on this panel with you, with you all. Um, today, part of my goals is to make clear the heart of our interconnected struggles um, from land back to the right of return, to make clear why Gaza is the cradle of not only our struggle as Palestinians, but also the cradle of our future as Palestinians and our return to the land. I want to provide a brief historical and political context to the assaults that are taking place on Gaza since the resistance began its land back operation on October 7th. And to make clear our joint struggle as Palestinians and indigenous, peop and indigenous peoples of North America. To start with Gaza, we know that as of date of this recording, there's only one hospital still operating in northern Gaza. Israel has bombed universities, schools, refugee camps, bakeries, grain mills, fishing boats, water supplies, mosques and churches, telecommunications infrastructure and homes. More than half of the residential buildings in Gaza have now been damaged and over 40,000 homes have been completely destroyed. It is now estimated that more than 1.7 million people are currently unable to live in their houses in the last 48 hours. We have witnessed the Israeli military lay siege to and raid Al Shifa Hospital, Gaza's largest medical center, where thousands of people have taken refuge. As the hospital was deprived of water, fuel, food, and basic necessities, doctors and hospital staff were forced to make unthinkable decisions to forego uh, anesthesia to disconnect patients from life-saving machinery, including 39 premature infants and in incubators in the neonatal intensive care unit. Israel's war on Gaza makes no real discernible distinction between civilians and combatants, and we know this. We know with the temporary pause on the violence that we're seeing on Gaza, uh, we know that this is only a temporary pause on the violence. Uh, Yara Eid, who is a Ghazawi journalist, uh, posted just this morning 
Imagine that you're only given four days of no bombardment after 48 days of complete terror. Four days, then you'll go back to the genocide. Four days, then you'll go back to the nonstop bombardment and massacres. Four days, and then you'll be killed any minute. And in those four days, you're not even allowed to go back to your homes in the city, north to check if your loved ones are still alive, to look for the body parts of your children under the rubble, to gather what's left of them and bury them. Right now, Israeli soldiers shot at many Palestinians trying to go back to their homes. So we know that with the call for this temporary ceasefire, or so-called ceasefire, that there was an escalation of violence onto the Palestinian people. This temporary ceasefire is taking place during U.S. Thanksgiving week weekend, which signals, uh, signals to us the want to appease settler comforts. A ceasefire, and I would like to remind folks of this, a ceasefire is only a conservative approach. It is the bare minimum of our, of our demands as Palestinians. We demand an immediate and permanent ceasefire and an end to the genocide. We demand a lift on the siege, the, to lift the siege on Gaza, an end to Canadian complicity in Israeli war crimes. And this includes an end to, funding, to the funding of arms to Israel, in addition to the release of all of our political prisoners. I want to encourage folks as we're talking today on a panel um, uh, in solidarity between indigenous peoples of North America uh, to Palestine, I'd like to encourage folks to think also towards our long-term aspirations, which are included in the heart of our interconnected struggle, which is that of land back and the right of return. The, ri the right of return or the return of land to indigenous hands and the return of a people to a land in which they were exiled. So namely the refugee right to return is at the heart of this struggle. We must remember that ceasefire is the bare minimum. What we're seeing today in Gaza is a continuation of what we know and what we call the Nakba. The Nakba or Nakba in Arabic uh, means the catastrophe. It describes the ongoing ethnic cleansing of Palestinians since 1948 when Israel celebrated its declaration, so on so declaration of independence at the expense of destroying over 500 Palestinian villages and exiling out over eight, that 800,000 Palestinian refugees. My family in particular, my grandfather and my grandparents' generation uh, were those who uh, were exiled from the north of Palestine, from the villages of Tarshiha and Quaykot uh, into several places. Uh, I have distant relatives in the West Bank and distant relatives in Gaza. My immediate family lives in one of the UN, uh, one of the UN um, sponsored refugee camps in Beirut, Lebanon, and they still live there today. We know that the Nakba is ongoing and is a settler colonial project, and we can no longer debate whether this is settler. This is a settler colonial endeavor. We know that Israel maintains its control over Palestinian land through house de de demolitions, the, re the replacement of native plant species with JNF forests, the separation wall, the blockade on Gaza, the 16 year elite blockade on Gaza, the military occupation since 1967, apartheid policies, uh, naming, renaming our land with Hebrew names, illegal settlements, segregation, incarceration of children, and so on and so forth. Stephen Salida wrote that Palestine is currently undergoing a form of garrison settlement that is closer to the earliest phases of US or North American settler colonialism. We know that British colonialism left Palestine in 1948 only to be replaced by the settler col colonial regime of Israel backed by the US empire. The Zionist myth of a Palestine as a land without a people for a people without a land is reminiscent of that of terra nullius, which is a Latin term meaning empty land. This was used as a justification for the colonization of the Americas. And we know that our colonizers and oppressors have shared notes and continue to share notes and that we must be diligent in sharing ours as well. Currently or recently, the Israeli occupation minister 
of military has op has openly gloated that this is the second Nakba and it's taking place in Gaza. The colonial remarks continue with what we see from uh, the Prime Minister of Israel tweeting and then later deleting his tweet that states, this is a struggle between the children of light and the children of darkness, between humanity and the laws of the jungle. This language, we've seen it time and time again. Uh, we've seen it in the old colonial playbooks and we see it again with the ways in which this battle of narratives is being utilized against the people of Gaza and the people of Palestine. Gaza is a coastal strip of land. It is a district of Palestine that lays on the ancient trading and maritime routes along the Mediterranean shore. It was held by the Ottoman Empire until 1917. It was passed to British, uh, from British to Egyptian to Israeli military rule over the last century and is now a fenced in enclave inhabited by over 2.3 million Palestinians. Gaza has been under Israeli air, land, and sea blockade since 2007, and 70% of Palestinians in Gaza are registered as refugees after their ancestors fled their homes within historic Palestine in 1948. This means that 30% of the people in Gaza are actually ancestrally from Gaza. This means that their families and their ancestors, their lineages, those people have refused to leave since the onset of settler colonial of the settler colonial Zionist regime. We must never forget about this 30% and what they teach us about resistance and Palestinian rootedness and steadfastness and the refusal to leave one's own land and territory. We know that the people of Gaza have already gone through five major assaults, all which have not been accounted for. And since October 7th, more than half of the population has been displaced. I'd like to take a moment to, to unpack this idea of collective punishment. So Israeli policy has entrenched this idea of collective punishment and the rhetoric of terrorism, which is a tired narrative used by our colonizers to repress our resistance and justify our genocide. We have our own understanding as a global indigenous peoples of our, of our own laws, but even in the UN international law, Palestinians have a right to resist their occupier. And we know that this is true by any means necessary. I want to assert a complete rejection of the language and rhetoric of terrorism in our movements. Palestinians have been heavily censored, condemned and violently suppressed in our resistance efforts. Colonized people are denied the right to speak even about Israel as a settler colonial uh, endeavor. And Palestinian resistance of any kind does not occur in a vacuum. It occurs within the context of 75 years of Israeli subjugation, dispossession, ethnic cleansing, and massacres. We know in the words of Franz Fanon that if they, the colonized, resist, the soldiers fire and they are dead men. And if they give in and degrade themselves, they are no longer men. Palestinians are often put in the defensive and we still often fail in having to defend ourselves time and time again. And I think now we no longer need to do that. The events of October 7th, when the Operation Al-Aqsa flood began was an unprecedented movement or moment in the global history of land back and material ideas of decolonization. The playbook for demonizing these efforts and the narrative of our oppressors and the weaponization of the rhetoric of terrorism is used by Israel to justify this genocide. And to date, the Israeli government has alleged that the hospitals it targeted were secret bases for Hamas, that the 42 journalists it killed in an airstrike were propaganda, pro pro propagandists for Hamas and even accused UN relief workers of being secret Hamas agents. The purpose of this construction is to conflate our resistance, our freedom fighters, and to distort the reality of Palestinian oppression and justify Israel's violence 
but also to police the borders of acceptable, acceptable discourse and thought among those who support Palestine. I want to affirm Palestinian re resistance by any means necessary and the right to it. We know how these battle of narratives also took place against the warriors of the 1990 Ganasatage resistance of Oka and the violent tactics that function within settler colonial agendas. And the Canadian Armed Forces and SQ continued to use counterinsurgency operations to maintain control and delegitimize Israel, sorry, indigenous communities' narratives of, of struggles towards self-determination. And they attempted to frame Ganesha, the, Ganesha, the people of Ganasatage as terrorists or criminals in the attempts to justify their use of violence and discredit the cause of warriors. I want to make clear that this distinction between nonviolent and violent resistance is one that we do not adhere to. Uh, there's no distinction for indigenous peoples and Palestinians to contest or debate the way we choose to resist is irrelevant when faced with the brutality of the settler colonial regime. We see this and we know that as a Palestinians, as Palestinians and indigenous peoples alike, we know that the colonizer will choose to deem any form of our resistance as violent. We see this with the imprison, imprisonment of many of our re revolutionary poets as seen in the case of the, of the Ghazawi poet, Musab Abu Toha, who was arrested along with other Ghazans near the Rafah the Rafa border, crossing with his family on their way to the US. We also know about the Great March of Return, which occurred from 2018 to 2019. The Great March of Return was a series of demonstrations held each Friday near the Gaza border from the, from the land day until the 27th of December in 2019. Palestinians walked on foot during this time to demand the right of return and the end of the siege on Gaza. As a result of their efforts, 223 Palestinians were killed, journalists were killed and targeted, and 30, 36,000 were injured by the Israeli occupation forces. When we talk about Palestine, it's important to understand Palestine from an indigenous perspective. This is a quote from the NDN collective position paper on the right of return as land back. They state, indigenous peoples protect and defend our land and our communities. The land convenes us and helps us to define who we are and what our purpose is. This is our shared relationship and understanding to indigenous peoples globally. While settler colonialism speaks to the Israeli state's ongoing structure of violence and describes a situation of continuous replacement, indigeneity speaks to life before the structure, resistance during it, and visions for the future. We know that Canada and Israel share notes we know that settler colonial violence has many tactics of segregation, incarceration, assimilation, and confrontation. The Canadian Special Forces, Operation Forces Command, trains the RCMP and was sent to Israel to be trained and trained on, on terrorism, including the strategy the RCMP used in Wet'suwet'en. We know that there are parallels between the past system and the checkpoint system in Palestine, which requires special permission from colonizers to move between ancestral lands, whether that be for work or enjoyment. We know that there are parallels between the ways in which our colonizers intended to remove and destruct, des destroy our food sources and livelihoods through the slaughtering of buffalo and olive trees and the uprooting of olive trees. We know that there is an over incarceration of our community members as a way of stifling our population's growth and resistance. One in five Palestinians have been incarcerated and 28% of Canada's prisoners are indigenous despite being 4% of the population. Many political prisoners are children. And we know that there is an intentional targeting of children and Israel's specific bombing of Gaza, which is a majority population of children 
is used on purpose. And this is reminiscent of the ways the first prime minister of Israel stated, the old will die and the young will forget. But we know that our seeds have spread into the diaspora and we know that we must resist the nation state wherever we are. We know that seven generations forward and seven generations back, that we have a fundamental connection to place and to land and to our kin. There have been many ways in which indigenous kin have showed up for us in the context of Tuggeranto alone. So Tuggeranto plant life mobilized right after the events of October 7th to harvest medicinal plants and to tease for our community. Land defenders have spoken out at our rallies to make the connections between land back and our right, for, right to return. Indigenous folks were leading our marches with jingle dancing, fancy shawl and grass dancing for healing and for, 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 to evoke the grief process for, for our people. We also know that the state works through counterinsurgency programs to repress the resistance of our people. And we're seeing heavier escalations in the repression of our people in the context of Toronto alone. This past Wednesday, over 11 arrests were made uh, of protesters who were demonstrating uh, and putting up posters at an indigo. The police raided the homes of people, seized their phones and their laptops. We know that the Toronto police and the state are putting putting out more presence, state presence, and surveillance of our people at our at our actions. And we know that because of this, we must join in our forces for radical joint struggle, which which includes. We must join hand in hand in joint struggle because we know that when the state escalates this repression against us, that we're, we're standing on the right side of history. And I'd like to close off here with a quote by Huey, Huey Newton. When the oppressor makes a vicious attack against freedom fighters because of the way that such freedom fighters choose to go about their liberation, then we know we are moving in the direction of our liberation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mays. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Gabor Mati. Thank you, Ellen, and uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I think it's uh, very germane and necessary that Indigenous people in Canada see the parallels and uh, support the struggle of the Palestinian people. Our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, who has been a full-throated supporter of Israel in both military and political and material terms, said something very true. He said that Canada and um, uh, Israel share the same values. They do. They're both created at the expense of the indigenous people of their respective lands and with their brutal suppression and oppression. So Trudeau could not have been more accurate. And um, I would hope that indigenous people in this country see the Palestinian cause as their own. I was rather appalled when the first indigenous premier of Manitoba, Reb Kenyu, said right after the October 7th events that he condemns the Israel uh, terrorist attacks against Israel, the targeting of civilians, and affirm Israel's right to self-defense. Now, I am not with uh, my friend uh, Mays on this one. I think the uh, October 7th events were appalling. Whatever exaggeration uh, they may have received, I don't consider the targeting of civilians um, a legitimate form of resistance. But that's not the point. What uh, Web Kanyu did not say is that what he calls Israel's right to self-defense has been for 75 years used as Israel's right to oppress the Palestinians. And this began in 1947-48. I'm going to read you something. This is an Israeli historian who supports the Nakba, who thinks it was a good idea, who actually argues that without it, 
Israel could not have been established, and he's absolutely right, without the suppression and expulsion and mass murder of the Palestinian people, Israel could not have been established. And he doesn't apologize for it. And he actually says, if we're already engaged in compulsion, maybe they should have done a complete job of it, get rid of all the Palestinians, not just of half of them, as they did in 1948. Um, he, he states that when he did his research, um, there were 24 cases of massacre in 1947, sorry, 48, by the Israeli uh, militaries, and rapes, and murders. Altogether, in 1948 alone, something like 15,000 Palestinian civilians were massacred. In the village of Dar Yassin, in April of 1948, Two uh, Jewish terrorist organization, one called the Lehi, the other called the Irgun, came and killed at least a hundred or more Palestinian civilians. They boasted they had killed more non-combatants, civilians. Now, the leader of Lehi, Yitzhak Shamir, later became a prime minister of Israel. The leader of the Irgun, Menachem Begin, later became a prime minister of Israel. These mass murderers became prime ministers of that country. And all the Israeli uh, prime ministers, generals, participated in the Nakba. So what we've had, the Palestinians have been facing is a state led by a series of mass murderers, not even dis historically disputable. So for an indigenous leader in Canada, and I was in Winnipeg just a few weeks before then, leading a trauma workshop for survivors of residential schools. And I saw, as I continue to see, the multi-generational effects of trauma on indigenous population. Actually, the figures for jails are even higher than Mays mentioned. 50% of the women in jail in this country are indigenous, 50%. So trauma is multi-generational. Now, in two, no, now, let's come back to Canada for a minute. In Canada, there's something called the Jewish National Fund, to which I can contribute tax deductibly. The Jewish National Fund is designed to buy land in Israel for Jews only. It's a racist organization, and Canada allows it tax-free status. What if there was an, a charity in Canada that, uh, that was allowed to buy land for anybody but indigenous people. And it was tax deductible. Avi Lewis and I, as Jews, have the right to arrive in Israel tomorrow, demand the right of citizenship under the law of return, but Mays doesn't have the right to go back and demand citizenship. So I'm encouraging here indigenous voices to speak up. Now, I mentioned trauma. Um, I visited the occupied territories the last time a year and a half ago to work with Palestinian women tortured in Israeli jails. Let me stop for a minute and just sidetrack, come back. Even if we see the events of October the 7th as an atrocity, which I do. Who committed that atrocity? In 2005, there was a study in the World Journal, Journal of World Psychiatry of traumatization in war zones. The highest level of traumatization of children before the election of Hamas, actually, was in Palestine. Over 90% of young people and children showed symptoms of trauma. Those people that did whatever they did on October the 7th, grew up as traumatized kids in the world's most concentrated area, highest density population. Mace has already talked about the conditions there. I don't have to repeat that. So even if we don't like and condemn when October the 7th, who committed it? People whose grandparents and whose parents had suffered 
a series of expulsions, massacres, and the massacres did not stop in 1948. They happened throughout the 1950s, happened again in 1967, happened again uh, in uh, 1982 in Lebanon. So even if there were people whose concept of liberation might have been tinged with hatred, who would blame them for that hatred? If the only Jews you ever saw were wearing army uniforms and shot at you when you were demonstrating peacefully and killed you and oppressed you and starved you and blockaded you, would you not hate these people? Quite apart from legitimate resistance, who could blame anybody for being full of hatred under that situation? I'm not saying to justify anything. I'm saying that if we're going to move forward, we're going to have to demand justice for the Palestinians, precisely so that um, they don't feel so alone, because the Palestinian narrative has been completely discredited, not even not, not discredited, lied about, denied, kept from public awareness in this country, precisely because, as Justin Trudeau said, this country and that one share the same values of colonialism and suppression of the individual of, of the uh, indigenous population. Now, when I visited Gaza, sorry, I should, I've been to Gaza, by the way. Nobody who hasn't seen it can believe it. But when I was in the occupied territories, um, I should say in the West Bank um, a year and a half ago, <clears throat> to work with these women tortured in Israeli jails, somebody said to me, we don't have post-traumatic stress disorder here. The trauma is never post. Now it's perfectly true that the state of Israel itself, you can make an argument, or you know, you can make a legitimate argument, rose out of Jewish trauma in Eastern Europe. That's true. It was an attempt to establish a Jewish entity so that Jews wouldn't have to be small minorities in hostile countries. But the Palestinians didn't do any of that. They didn't come to Europe to oppress the Jews. Why do they have to pay for the crimes of Hitler and all the anti-Semites in Eastern Europe? So Jewish trauma may explain some of the impetus behind the creation of the State of Israel. It does not explain, it does not justify it in any way whatsoever. But it does condition how Palestinians look at Israel and how would you look at a country that continues to steal your land, torture your population, jail people? They have no right to jail anybody for resisting the occupation. It's the legal right of an occupied people to resist, even by and by including by military force. But in Israel, that's a crime. If you throw a stone at a tank, that's a crime. Some of the children, some of the people let out today under the truce agreement were people that threw stones. It is really military vehicles. Now, there was a former head of the Israel Defense Forces, I forget his name, some general, who six months ago said that the situation of the Palestinians in the occupied territories reminds him of the situation of the Jews in pre-war Germany. And what did he mean by that? He meant that in pre-war Germany, the Nazi thugs would attack Jews and oppress them and, and, and you know, humiliate them and harass them and commit violence against them. And the police would show up in support of the thugs. And this Israeli general said, that army does the same thing. When the settlers harass, even kill, despoil, humiliate the Palestinians, the army shows up to protect the settlers. So that's the situation. So when, when Webb can you and who's just parroting the usual political line, and I don't mean to single him out, I was just so disappointed that an indigenous person would take that line. When he says that Israel has the right to defend itself, against whom? Against the people that it has massacred, dispossessed, tortured, uh, invalidated, humiliated. And the Israeli general, Moshe Dayan, who was one of the 
perpetrators of the Nakba, of course, the big military hero in Israel. In 1956, there was a Israeli soldier killed by somebody from Gaza, and there was a burial. This is the same year, by the way, that the Israeli military killed two or three hundred Palestinian men, women, and children in their beds in a town called Khan Yunus. So this Israeli soldier had been killed. And Moshe Dayan said, let's not hate the people who did this. They look from their fields, they look from their enclave, where we forced them into, where we expelled them into, and they look at the fields that used to be theirs. Of course they hate us. At least he was honest. He was a colonialist. He was a militarist. But at least he was an honest one compared to the hypocrisy of today. And so, yes, I'm going to finish, even though the hand isn't up yet, because really I've said what I wanted to say. What we're dealing with here is a highly traumatized population, which to, since 2005 has been even more traumatized, brutally so, in a way that the Western press does not report. I do call upon... I don't expect, I don't have the right to demand anything. But I do call upon our indigenous brothers and sisters to raise their voices in solidarity and let, the, let your leaders know that to speak like Webkin you did is to do a grave disservice, not just to the Palestinian people, but also to your own people and to the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Gabor, for, for that. Um, sometimes words escape me, um, but I do appreciate your sharing with us. And um, I agree with you that the words of Wab Canoe um, were disrespectful, inappropriate, and we are hoping that more Indigenous people through this webinar will rise and support uh, our Indigenous brothers uh, in Palestine, brothers and sisters. Our next speaker is Avi Lewis. It's a great honor to welcome you, Avi. Ellen, thank you so much. Um, thanks to Mace, uh, to Gabor, to Clifton and Samir, and uh, everyone on the panel today. Um, I'm really grateful for this and for every opportunity to, to show solidarity. As a Jewish person watching genocidal violence in Gaza, there's a particular kind of horror and grief for those of us Jews who feel on the right side of history with the majority of people. The uh, Israeli government claims to be uh, persecuting this horrific, horrific genocidal violence against Gaza so that people like me can be safe. So I say, not in my name. And I am proud to be a member of Independent Jewish Voices, which is standing up in Canada as Jewish Voice for Peace, and, and if not now, are standing up uh, uh, in the United States to say, not in our name. The truth is that killing thousands upon thousands of innocent civilians, two-thirds of whom are women and children, we cannot escape the, 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 the horror we can't close our eyes to, to, the, to the unspeakable acts that we are witnessing in real time. It's all a violation of every international law, every principle of human decency, and fundamental rights and morality. It doesn't make anyone safe, certainly not Jews in the diaspora. And it's so important, it's such an important moment in history to, for us as Jews to stand up and say that. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm grateful for that opportunity. I must, however, respectfully and, and but strongly disagree with, with Mays. Um, there is a right of occupied people to resist occupation, even under international law. Killing civilians is never okay. We can't cite international law with exceptions. There's just no murdering civilians, which is okay. It was not okay on October 7th. It was not okay on October 9th. It was not okay on October 8th, 10th, 12th, and up until today. Um, that's my position. I believe that it is the position of people of conscience, um, and resistance cannot include crimes against humanity. 
the way we saw from Hamas on October 7th. Um, what we want is a world in which everyone can live in comfort and safety. What Israel is doing is deprived Palestinians of that for 75 years. For every moment that I've been alive since the occupation started when I was three weeks old, 56 years ago, and certainly in the 16 years that Gaza has been under complete and total siege, everybody is less safe, including Jews in Israel and everywhere else. Um, I was also in Gaza in 2009, six months after another terrible attack called Cast Lead, saw government buildings demolished, met families who had lost everyone in a single bomb strike, and had some of the most meaningful, powerful, beautiful connections with them, some of the most generous and sensitive, intelligent, humane um, activists that it's ever been my pleasure to meet in Gaza. So <clears throat> what I want to start share uh, today is a little reflection on the, the use of anti-Semitism to silence the, the, uh, the accusation of anti-Semitism to silence legitimate uh, dissent and critique of the actions of the state of Israel. And it's really important to start where we are with this thing that happened this week where, and there's an incredible story on the breach that just went up today, the breach media, about these protests. There were uh, posters uh, on, on, the, on the windows of Indigo bookstores uh, splashed with, you know, washable red paint. And then on Wednesday, we saw these pre-dawn raids, people's apartments trashed, people dragged away in handcuffs, this huge, expensive uh, Toronto police investigation into hate speech. And what was the crime? You know, Jesse Brown of Canada Land called it an attack on a Jewish-owned bookstore. That is such a, a, a reductionist and, and ideological way of describing what was a legitimate protest against Heather Reisman, who's the CEO of Indigo, um, and who has been protested by Jews and, 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 and Palestinians and this Palestinian solidarity movement for more than 15 years for running a charity that sends millions of dollars every year to support foreign soldiers who join the Israeli army. That is a legit, when, when the federal NDP and other political parties and forces in Canada are calling for an arms embargo on Israel until it, it complies with international law, it is utterly legitimate for activists to identify and to protest uh, the CEO of a major business in Canada uh, that runs a charity that provides millions of dollars in direct support to the Israeli uh, army. So, in fact, the framing of a legitimate protest against uh, Heather Eastman and Indigo as anti-Semitism is the, that the success of that framing in the mainstream media, and it's, it's taking up by the, by the Toronto police, is actually the victory of many years of effort by people like Heather Reisman, her husband, Jerry Schwartz, uh, the principal figure in a huge uh, vulture capital firm called Onyx, um, and other right-wing uh, Zionists in, in Canada. And there's a history here that I won't go into in depth, but I think is really important to share and to learn that in the 1990s, Jerry, uh, Jerry Schwartz and Heather Reisman and others executed a forced merger of the liberal Zionist and other uh, mainstream Jewish groups in Canada, especially Canadian Jewish Congress. They, there was a, co a coordinated and very open campaign at the time to take over these more centrist uh, uh, liberal Zionist Jewish groups across Canada and force them into a merger so that only the, the center, of, um, the Canada-Israel Committee, which became CJA, the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, uh, remained. Uh, there's a handful of others, B'nai B'rith, which is even more extreme, and Hillel, which is an extremist group, in my view, on, on campuses especially. These extreme Zionist Jewish groups in Canada present themselves as the only voice of the, of the entire Jewish community. And that is not true. It's less and less true with every passing day of genocidal violence by the state of Israel in Gaza. It's, it's more and more true with every passing day of Jews of conscience standing up and saying, not in our name. Um, but it was a coordinated campaign to take over the voices of mainstream Jewish uh, life in Canada and shove them to the far extreme Zionist right. And that's what we've seen. So there's a big battle going on now within the Jewish community over who actually gets to speak for Jews. And it's very, very important for people in Palestinian sol in the Palestinian solidarity movement to understand that those groups are extremist groups like Sija. Um, they say a lot of impossibly racist things, and they do not represent all Jews in Canada. Being against Zionism 
is not the same as anti-Semitism. Anti-Zionism is absolutely not anti-Semitism. And in fact, another little piece of history I can share very briefly, and again, I won't go into, into detail, within the Jewish world, this debate about Zionism has been going on since the, since the 19th century. My family's political tradition, some people know that David Lewis, my grandfather, was one of the founding figures in the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation, the CCF, which became later became the NDP in the 1960s in Canada. We come from a tradition called the Bundist tradition, the Jewish Labor Bund, which was a Jewish socialist organization, political party, trade union movement in, in, um, in Eastern Europe in the early 20th century. And we fought against the Zionists as Bundists uh, and, and said it is not a good idea to go and, and, and create a Jewish state in someone else's land in Palestine. And that debate about Zionism has been going on within the Jewish world for a very, very long time. Uh, our last point I want to make is the question of Israel as a settler colonial state um, and the parallels with um with Canada as a settler colonial state. There are many, as May said, they speak to each other, they compare notes. They have mutually inspired each other as genocidal projects. There's no question about that. And today, Israel is unquestionably a settler colonial state with active settler colonization of more and more Palestinian land, olive groves, the destruction of houses, the bulldozing of communities going on every single day and the, and the building of illegal settlements. But there is every settler colonial project has its own nature and specificity and history. And it is important to also remember as Gabor said, that there was uh, something specific about the formation of the of the Jewish uh, state, of the state of Israel uh, in Palestine, which is that many of the original settlers in 1948 were traumatized survivors of a genocide. That's not the case for the settler colonial project in Canada, or the United States, or Australia. Many of the same ideas were used, but the empires that settled Canada and the United States were not led by a population that had just itself survived a genocide. So I think it's really important to hold these contradictory thoughts. And that's why in just my last minute here, uh, um, before we pass it on to the next panelist, I wanted to share a presentation, a very brief one that I saw recently online, a fantastic um, set of illustrations by the uh, Jews for Racial Economic Justice Group in the States uh, in collaboration with this uh, VENT diagrams. I think you guys can see it, yeah? These are just my selection of eight contradictory thoughts that we have to hold about Israel-Palestine in this moment. Many Jews still see Israel as essential to Jewish safety. I'm not one of them, as, as I just said, but many Jews still see it that way. At the same time, maintaining Israeli apartheid makes Jews everywhere less safe. These two things are true. Israeli Jews had their sense of safety shattered on October 7th, and I think that's true. It's also true that Palestinians have never had a day of safety since the Nakba in, in 1948, and nowhere in Gaza is safe, as all of us have said here today. The scale of Israeli and Palestinian death is vastly different. Israel is consciously taking 10 or more Palestinian lives for every Jewish life. That reflects a dehumanization of not seeing Palestinian lives as human lives. And that's why at the same time as we see the vastly different scales of, of suffering and of death, we assert that every life is precious and that every death is a tragedy. Apartheid dehumanizes Palestinians. It's is built on the dehumanization project. It also dehumanizes Jews in Israel and beyond. And, you know, it's also true that this is really complex. There's a lot of history. This is an American group, but we could say most of us don't know the full history. It's also not complex at all. It's very, very simple. Apartheid is wrong. Hamas committed war crimes. I believe that's true. They did it, as Gabor said, in the aftermath of decades of Israeli war crimes and, and, and uh, genocidal policies. And they helped Hamas gain power. And they consciously did that. And to end, a ceasefire is urgent and necessary. It's not the same as this four-day pause. A ceasefire is permanent. Put down the weapons. Stop killing people. And that is just the beginning. A ceasefire is not justice. It's the precondition for beginning to build justice. And that is the urgent cause to which all of us need to respond. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Avi. That is powerful and it's informative. And I think it's it's needed to be said. I mean, we have you and Gabor talking about that 
And I think just sort of hitting that that message home that Israel does not represent all Jews and that uh, we need to keep everybody safe. Everybody's, when one person's human rights is affected, everybody's rights is affected. So I thank you both for, for bringing that perspective, an important perspective into this discussion. Uh, I would like to invite now Samir Shaheen Hussein. Thanks, Ellen. Um, thanks to Maze, uh, Gabor, Avi, and uh, Clifton as well to be sharing this panel together, um, and to the entire team behind the scenes who uh, made this important event possible, and for the 300 plus um, participants who, who took the time to, to listen to us. When Ellen invited me to participate on this panel, I told her that I've never been to Palestine and that as such, I'm not the best person to speak about health and healthcare there. However, she insisted, Given the horrific violence inflicted on Palestinian children in recent weeks and the trauma that is certainly felt by all children in the region for many decades, she suggested that I draw on my experience as a settler, pediatric emergency physician, and social justice organizer to make parallels with what is happening in Palestine and the work I've done in confronting Canadian medical colonialism against Indigenous children here. So that's what I'll try to do in the 10 minutes I have. First, some context. In January 2018, I spearheaded the hashtag A Hand to Hold campaign, which confronted the Quebec government's practice of separating children from their families during medical evacuation airlifts. Although the practice impacted hundreds of children in remote and rural communities throughout the province every year, it disproportionately affected northern indigenous communities, especially the EU and the Inuit. I'm sure anyone can imagine how traumatizing it would be for a child to be transferred for emergency medical care without a par parent or caregiver. In the case of these Indigenous children, all of this occurred in the broader colonial context, which included the forced remo removals of children from their families and communities, whether it be through residential schools, youth protection services, or even the healthcare system. The campaign was ultimately successful later that year, in 2018, with the draconian non-accompaniment rule being replaced by an actual policy to allow caregiver accompaniment for all children, requiring medical evacuation on the flying hospital plane. In my book, Fighting for Hand to Hold, Confronting Medical Colonialism Against Indigenous Children in Canada, I basically contextualize the non-accompaniment rule and the ha ha hand to hold campaign that ended it in the longer history of Canadian medical colonialism, a concept that draws on the work of Indigenous and non-Indigenous scholars and activists to refer to a culture or ideology rooted in systemic anti-Indigenous racism that uses medical practices and policies to establish, maintain, and or advance a genocidal colonial project. So what's the connection with the situation in Palestine? Well, there are many, but I'll share just one example. In the summer of 2018, during the campaign, the Israeli award-winning Haaretz journalist Amira Haas wrote a story that caught my attention. After several months and at least two missed appointments, a mother from Gaza was finally allowed to accompany her three-year-old child for chemotherapy and other treatment in Nablus in the West Bank. Over a year later, in another, in another heart-wrenching article in, in Haaretz, Israeli journalists Gideon Levy and Alex Levak described how they were, there were seven children from the Gaza Strip admitted to pediatric cancer ward um, of a hospital in Nablus. Only two of them were with their mothers. The others were with aunts or grandmothers or even with women they barely knew. Basically, whomever was able to get an exit permit from Gaza. The WHO has hinted at the arbitrariness of Israel's permit regime, given that there is no explanation for delays or denials of permits in most instances. According to a 2023 um, report published by the WHO, 32% of children with approved permits to travel for health care from the Gaza Strip did not have a parent approved to accompany them, which meant that they had to travel with another adult or not at all because unaccompanied children are not eligible to travel for medical care alone. More recently, according to Save the Children, the application for permits for almost 400 children in Gaza to go to the West Bank for critical health care in the first six months of 2023 were either ignored or denied. The NGO mentions that some children died of conditions like leukemia and congenital heart defects last year, because they did not receive their exit permits on time to access life-saving surgery or urgent medication. Why did these children have to travel for care in the first place? Well, that's because such treatments are not available in Gaza because of the restrictions imposed by Israel on medical equipment and medication that can enter the Gaza Strip. Going back to the Haaretz piece by Levy and Livak, they essentially made some of the most some of the same arguments we had made during the campaign. They wrote how difficult it must have been for a child's parents to not be by her side not to hug her, caress her, tend to her in her suffering. They described the atmosphere of distress and helplessness as being, and I quote, a portrait of the essence of Israeli evil. This is just 
one of too many examples of how the health and wellness of children in Gaza have been impacted for years. Imposed food insecurity, poverty, and most of the water in Gaza being deemed unfit for human consumption only make the situation worse. Indeed, in September 2023, Save the Children issued a warning that Gaza's health system um, remains on the brink of collapse after 16 years of blockade, and that along with recurrent escalations of violence, this poses a constant threat to children's lives in Gaza. That was in September of 2023. For some context, according to the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, between 2018, uh, 2008 until um, and 6 October 2023, over 1,400 Palestinian children were reportedly killed with an, ad with an additional 32,000 sustaining injuries, primarily at the hands of Israeli occupation forces. Of these, over 1,000 children were killed in Gaza alone since the unlawful black blockade began in 2007. During the same time frame, 25 Israeli children were killed, mostly by Palest Palestinian ass assailants, and 524 were injured. Meanwhile, again, according to the OHCHR, an average of 500 to 700 Palestinian children are reported to be detained by Israeli occup occupation forces each year, with an estimated 13,000 mostly arbitrarily detained, interrogated, tried in military courts and imprisoned since 2000. At a vigil held on November 15th in Montreal in solidarity with the besieged healthcare workers in Gaza, a psychiatrist spoke out about a 2022 study on the psychological effect of occupation and chronic warfare on Palestinian children, which showed that 95% of children from the Gaza Strip showed symptoms of anxiety, depression, and trauma, pointing to the fact that the plight of Palestinian children's mental health is so unique that we must talk about continuous rather than post-traumatic stress disorder. The speaker went on to explain that in Gaza, a 15-year-old had experienced five periods of intense bombardment in their life, 2008-9, 2012, 2014, 2021, and now. After the surprise attack by Hamas on October 7th that resulted in the taking of 200 hostages and the deaths of over uh, 1,200 Israelis, including children, what is going to be the impact of the intense militarized state violence inflicted as collective punishment by the Israeli military on the population of Gaza, including over 1 million Palestinian children? On November 7th, Defense for Children International Palestine reported that Israeli forces had killed twice as many ch Palestinian children in Gaza over the past month than the total number of Palestinian children killed in the West Bank and Gaza combined since 1967. Well over a thousand are missing under the rubble of destroyed buildings, with many presumed to be dead. According to Save the Children, the number of children reported killed in just three weeks in Gaza is more than the number killed in armed conflict globally across more than 20 countries over the course of a whole year for the last three years. All of this inflicted suffering and death is what prompted a UNICEF spokesperson to say that Gaza has become a graveyard for thousands of children. It's a living hell for everyone else. For those children who will survive, the injuries and other traumas will mark them for the rest of their lives. The situa situation is so dire that medical teams in Gaza even coined a new term for a large number, number of injured children coming to the hospitals, as Ellen mentioned earlier. WCNSF, Wounded Child, No Surviving Family. An opinion piece recently published, recently published in the medical journal The Lancet by Aisha Kadir and Vinay Kampalat noted that as humanitarians, we know that every war is a war on children and that taking a child's right, rights approach to bearing witness requires us to equally value every child's life and potential and refrain from dehumanizing rhetoric. They concluded by stating that silence kills History will judge us for how we respond today, and the world's children are watching. I think it speaks to a monstrous level of dehumanization of Palestinians that has taken such a significant level of suffering, death, and carnage, requiring children's mutilated and dead bodies to be put on display for many of us to have started to take action. For those of us who are settler, settlers here living in Canada, there are also important economic, political, and military ties between Canada and Israel. That, have to be mind that we have to be mindful of when taking action. A recent occupational therapy graduate, graduate who also spoke at the Montreal vigil last week, made this connection brutally clear when she spoke about the shame she feels for being able to work in a safe environment with equipment that works, plentiful supplies, and without mourning families with a fear of bombs and displacement. But she said, and I quote, most of all, shame that I know that my own salary, the one I used to treat people here in Canada, is being used to finance the death of my own family in Palestine. In the context of medical personnel and hospitals being bombarded while having to care for countless patients in a devastated healthcare system, a Doctors Without Borders emergency physician wrote a few words on a Gaza hospital whiteboard that has haunted me. 
it said, we did what we could remember us. We must remember them, but we must do more than that to honor them. The Health Workers Alliance for Palestine, an organization that recognizes the importance of remaining in direct opposition to settler colonial violence from Turtle Island to Palestine, has called a coast-to-coast day of action for Palestine on November 30th with its four main demands. Immediate ceasefire, stop targeting hospitals and health workers, end the siege on Gaza, end the occupation on the apartheid system. As we have seen over the last few weeks, there are always attempts to silence the voices of those who fight and struggle for genuine peace and justice so that all people can live in dignity. However, we can draw inspiration from the late lesbian and feminist activist, Melanie K. Kantrowitz, who was the founding director of Jews for Racial and Economic Justice, as Avi was just talking about. In her book, The Colors of Jews, she famously stated, the political version of love is solidarity. My sister, herself a speech language therapist, recently shared with me that at, Palestine's, at, a, at a Palestine solidarity demonstration she attended, she found it both inspiring and depressing. All this dissent and yet a genocide could not be pre- prevented, she wrote me. In response, her friend and social justice activist, Jane Guskin, shared some grounding words that I would like to end my talk with. In this moment, nothing we do will ever be enough. And yet everything we do matters. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samir. Um, very poignant and, and very eloquent. Um, and I think it's really important to talk about the, those who are most vulnerable, who are babies and incubators, children. And, um, you know, we need to do something. And I think over the years we've known that um, we have failed Palestine. We have failed them and we need to We need to step up to the plate. And I'm urging all the Indigenous folks who are sitting in their homes safely to talk about and express this in your posts. Use the social media as a tool uh, for compassion and for peace and for solidarity for Palestinian people who are suffering a great deal. Uh, I would like to invite my good friend, um, and we joke around, he's my husband, but um, this is my good friend Clifton Nicholas, and he's going to talk about uh, his trip to Palestine. Clifton has been uh, one of the warriors in 1990, and he uh, is also a longtime uh, activist for human rights. Clifton. Um, I'm very flattered to have been asked to speak on this uh, very prestigious panel. I also like to uh, extend uh, my gratitude towards uh, members of uh, Independent Jewish Voices for helping me get to Palestine uh, when I went on my trip. It was very much appreciated. Um, I had been involved with uh, with uh, learning and understanding about Palestine uh, since about 1998, uh, really getting involved uh, since I started uh, going to Concordia University, understanding about uh, what was going on in that country uh, what the situation was, what the players were, uh, trying to understand the the totality of what's going on uh, with this situation, and how does it reflect on on, on my situation, who I am as an Indigenous person here in, in the context of Canada. And as I went on, I could find a glaring, absolutely glaring similarities between the plights of my people and the plights of the Palestinian people. When you see the way the land was taken down and taken away from people, the way their societies had been disintegrated, uh, getting into the nuances of 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 uh, how their 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 oppression unrolled with the use of apartheid and how the, impre- the oppression of my people were unfolded with the use of the Indian Act and getting to the history of where the Indian Act came from, right? And I I I came up with an, uh, with this statement saying that uh you know Canada invented the Indian the the apartheid. Uh, sorry, let me start that again. Canada invented apartheid. South Africa refined it, and Israel Israel perfected it, and they technological they made it technological. Moreover, than any other of the the countries that used that system of governance against the indigenous population, you know, going and visiting Palestine, I I spent ten days ten days there, and I felt like I spent a lifetime there. I wish I'd stayed a little longer. I'd gone around the time of. Uh, the, the commemoration of the Nakba in the in Israeli Independence Day, and and 
it was um, kind of a mind-bending experience, to say the least, uh, going through all the levels of security just to get to Bethlehem, to the hotel where I was staying at. But getting out of Israel and into the West Bank, into Bethlehem, I felt like I came home. I felt like I was in my home. I felt like I was on a big reserve because it was a big reserve called Palestine, right? called the Occupied Territories. Um, in a lot of ways, similar to what we experience in our communities as far as uh, not having not having an economy, a proper economy, uh, having uh, too much policing and not enough justice, uh, actually. Um, it, 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 it felt very similar to me. Um, I have to say that, 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 that the people of Palestine, I, I never felt more welcomed by them. And, and I was given, I was given, um, I was given something by them was, uh, was a request that I, that I go there and I see, and what I see, I take back and I teach and I tell people what it is that you see over that, that country, what is the realities on the ground in Palestine. And that alone, that alone solicited everything that they ever wanted from me was just that, just take our story with you. Every Palestinian I met, they would say the same thing. Tell them about us. Are you going to tell them about us? And everyone I met, met also also uh, would bring up the, you know, Mahmoud Art, uh, Darwish's uh, poem, The Red Indian. And, you know, they, they, would, they would say, we're the same. We relate. We're the same people. And not knowing, knowing who he was, but not knowing that poem, and finally coming home and reading it and, and, and seeing the similarities of what he was saying and what my people are surviving, what we've gone through, what we're still surviving. And it is very important for us to have a form of solidarity and understanding of what happens in Palestine and how it affects us. Because the same colonialism that exists there started here and still exists and persists in this country and in North America for that matter, North and South America. Not just North, let's not uh, that, yeah, forget about South America being part of that colonial project, also. <clears throat> but I, I, I try to do that as much as I can. It, it's, it's, it's a hard thing, I find, in our in indigenous communities to talk about um, the Palestinian and Israeli situation. <clears throat> a lot of our people in our community. Uh, are are followers of, of of evangelical Christianity, and and in that theology, they they teach them, you know that that the 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 Jewish people are the chosen people, and any any um, negative talking about them is bad. It's a sin, you know. Uh, I used to, I grew up like that too. I grew up uh, with a Pentecostal church on my back as as a child, and I grew up with all those those things, you know that. They're the chosen people. The Jewish people are the chosen ones. They're 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 they're, they're above. They're they're better than right. Um, and then you had like non non indigenous preachers who'd come to the church and and have the same refrain, right? That what you were as an indigenous person was wrong, and it was backwards, and it's it, it's a deviant thing to be to be indigenous. So I, I can understand why there are some indigenous people who don't know any better. And would speak in, in 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 a way that that's not supporting in Palestinian rights. Uh, I understand where it comes from because they don't know any better, and it's up to people like myself, like Ellen and other Indigenous people, to teach them <clears throat> about the real realities of what's happening in Palestine and how it relates to our own colonization. Because I, again, you know, I, I I I can't see my people's freedom without the freedom of the Palestinian people. I think uh, Nelson Mandela said that. That you can't you can't be free. If they can't be free, we can't be free either. And it, it, it all ties in. And um, it's been so terrible to watch the events unfolding and the world doing absolutely nothing. The frustration I feel some days watching, and I'm sure I'm not I'm, the, I'm not the only one. Uh, it, it, it it's 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 hard to even put into words what I feel inside when I see the things unfolding on the, on the screens in 4K. You know, and and the world does nothing, and, and and there's people who support that in our government. It blows my mind. Um, however, on the other side of that that coin, I've never seen so much um, attention being given to the situation. 
as I do now. If you want to put a positive on it in any way, yeah, I've never seen Palestine being on the lips of so many people at so, so many days as it has been now. We're seeing something that we've never seen before. The last generation to see this, they saw this in the Second World War with the, with the concentration camps and that Holocaust and that genocide. We're seeing this unfold again in front of our eyes. But we have the ability to talk about it more than they were able to talk about it back then. We have the ability to reach more people. And we will. You know, we, we their propaganda isn't working anymore. You know, you, you watch the news. Even I, I, I think the newscasters are starting to have a hard time to believe their own bullshit. Um, I wonder if they if they wash their mouths out when they get home. Because some of the, the absolute lies and, and that I keep hearing on TV, it's it, it, you can tell that the, the the foundations of that castle are crumbling when they have to stoop to such low lies to get their points across. Um, I just think that we just got to keep doing hard work, putting out our voices, and keep educating and educating, uh, giving out information. Like I share links to documentaries that people need to learn about the history of of where it started from in, in Israel, Palestine. It didn't start on October 7th. It started in 1948, even started before that. Educate yourself and educate people around you about what you know already. I think that's the most important thing. If we know and we don't share it, then that's the problem. That's where the big problem is going to be. And like I said, I made a promise when I was in Palestine to the people I met there that fed me and held me and treated me like a brother, that I will come home and I will educate people as much as I can. And uh, that's that's uh, the least I could do for the for the for for what I received um, from the people, the will that I, that I got from them to to continue doing what I do. Um, it, it means a lot to me to be able to teach about what their their struggle is, and I, I don't have much more to say than that. Um, I would thank you all for your time. Now, and your call, Clifton, and. Um... Thank you to Gabor, Avi, um, Samir, Clifton, and, and Mays. Um, we have to keep going, and we have to. This is going to be a long, uh, long fight, and, and I know people are tired, but I can't imagine the people in Gaza how tired they must be to have food, water, and medicine used as a weapon, a tool of war, is unacceptable. To see children dying in a war that they did not have anything to do with is unacceptable. For world leaders to say nothing and to stand by a genocide that is evidently folding in front of the world's eyes is unacceptable. And so I hope that people will continue to fight for justice, uh, for, for Palestine, um, for all of us, essentially. Um, I do appreciate the time that you have all taken to, to be part of this. We have all learned so much and we are all learning still so much more. Uh, Clifton mentioned some documentaries. Uh, Tortura is one that you can can watch. Uh, there's something on Netflix, which is a dramatization of the first Nekba, uh, Farha. Um, you know, I, I value the expertise of Gabor and all his work that he's doing to sensitize people and educate people uh, of trauma and what it does to your brain, to your physical body, to, to our spirits. And so I thank you so much, Gabor, for being part of this panel and, and, and honoring us with your, with your knowledge and wisdom. I thank Abby for, you know, just being you and to be the powerful speaker and supporter of justice for everyone. Uh, and that you have agreed to, to talk about what anti-Semitism is, what Zionism is, and to make that distinction, which I think is really important at this time. To Samir, you know, you you always amaze me with the knowledge and how you bring things together so quickly uh, and so so wonderfully, and and so important that health workers uh, are supported, especially during this time. And to Clifton for your words of wisdom and uh, your stories of being there uh, with the people who are experiencing this genocide today. I thank you all for being here. Um, and I invite you to, to continue this session um, with some of the youth who are going to be following afterwards. But I also encourage you, if you can, tomorrow on Parliament Hill in Ottawa, 
there is a national day of protest for justice and solidarity and for a permanent ceasefire in Gaza. So thank you all very, very much. Uh, it means a lot to me that you were all here and I'm sure it means a lot to the people of Gaza and in Palestine. Your goal. Seeing here. Hi. Are we good to go yet? No. Hi. Okay. Um, so my name is Veronica. Uh, I was invited on this call to moderate. Um, I'm based in Edmonton, Treaty 6 territory. Uh, my family comes from El Salvador, Yellow Quill First Nation. I'm an organizer here in Edmonton, artist, helper. Um, I've been like pretty deeply moved by the call in by Palestinians. Um, as indigenous people, we are responsible for confronting this nation state of Canada for the blood on its hands, both in our homelands and in Palestine. Um, our people need more literacy on Palestine, more literacy on Canada's complicity. So um, that's kind of what the objective of this conversation was to be. Like we know um, Canada has always been on the side of genocide. We know what genocide looks like. We know how our stories of genocide are told and correctly, retold and correctly. Um, and we have more political leverage as Indigenous people than anyone else in Canada, even if it feels like we don't. Um, so we really do need to be connecting the dots to how free Palestine is deeply related to the liberation of our own homelands against these violent war machines. Um, so we've come together before and there are Palestinians in our communities right now calling on us to name this occupation, name Canada for its violent contributions to genocide and take action. So we've invited some people to showcase what solidarity can look like. Um, so I can, maybe I'll start by introducing everybody. Is everyone's camera on? Are we good on that? Okay. Um, so first I'm gonna introduce uh, Sam Hamilton a Coast Salish grassroots organizer and direct action practitioner. We're also invited, yeah, we, we invited Mila Nakeko, who is Dene, Dene Sultane, uh, from Litoke First Nation in Dene Da. She's a multidisciplinary artist, filmmaker, moose hide tanner, and mother. And we are also here with Dusty from Mobilize. Dusty is from Wabasca, Alberta, living in a Miskwachi, Utilizing clothing design as a form of voice, activism, storytelling, and empowerment. We are also here with Peace Ukraine. Peace Ukraine is from Nipsikupak, Samson Cree Nation, and is currently based in Edmonton, Alberta. They're an Indigenous birth worker activist whose work is centered around disability and reproductive justice and education. Um, we're gonna, we are gonna go over time a bit but I'm actually gonna give everybody about 10-ish minutes, give or take, to say what they have to say about these, these questions that we've prepared. Uh, there's two of them, but we're gonna kind of just allow people to share what they, what they feel like they need to share. I mean, maybe they're not gonna answer the questions like explicitly, but why do you stand for Palestine? And what does indigenous solidarity with Palestine look like for you? That could mean, how do you connect your work art, culture, organizing to Palestinian organizing in your communities. And I'm gonna pass it to CM. Hi everybody, uh, my name is CM Hamilton. I'm Stalo and Nuchanoff. I come from the West Coast of what's now known as British Columbia. Um, my mom is from the Fraser River Basin where the ocean and the river meet just outside of what's now known as Vancouver. And my dad is from the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, I'm an intergenerational grassroots organizer. Um, I, I've grown up around action, activism, arts, community, storytelling. Um, I, a lot of the, the foundations and the, the value systems I operate from um they they come from like the old people from my territories and they're reflective of the um the way that i i hope to care about the land they're reflective of the 
the value systems that created the the rivers, the waters, the ocean, the air, the sky, all of the things that I believe in, um, they they very much reflect something before humans and something before um, what we understand, like as as Canada now. Um, so that's very much what what centers me is is knowing um, I, I come from like a a long line of people that. Um, our presence is immeasurable and that we've been here before time. And um, I, I guess I'm, I'm walking into this like a little frustrated, if I'm being completely honest. Um, the first half of this webinar, um, we had some Jewish voices that were speaking on or in solidarity uh, with Palestinian people. And within the first three speakers, um, I, I watched two Jewish voices condemn October 7th and condemn the acts of um, Palestinian people who were engaged in land back in a material sense and were engaged in um, like, a, I think, just like a, a form of direct action. And I, I really like, I hope to, I, I, I'm begging people to think about uh, who has the monopoly on violence. And I think it's really important that people living here in Canada as citizens, um, what I would say as settlers, I, I don't think that the term citizen is neutral. And I think that the way Gabor and Avi used the term citizen and condemned acts of violence against citizens was inappropriate and frustrating. And I think that it's not a neutral terminology and it's not something that people just become. You're not born a citizen, you're born a settler. It's not okay to condemn Palestinian people for the ways in which they resist colonialism and genocide. So I'm feeling a little frustrated right now and I'm feeling like May's voice, the person, the only Palestinian person on that panel was undermined. Um, yeah, I think like the only reason I care about solidarity with Palestinian people is because our struggles are intrinsically tied. I don't think they're separate. I think our freedom is intrinsically tied. I think that the way in which we live and engage with our land and our freedom, I think that all of these things are incredibly important to acknowledge. Um, I think that all of the pain and all of the suffering that the generations of Indigenous people living in this territory, all, all of those things, um, they mirror, they're not always the same, but they mirror a lot of what Palestinian people have been through. Um, I think all oppressed people, I think that we, we have to care about each other. We have to uplift each other's voices. We have to listen. Um, that's where I'm at right now. Um, I no one had to tell me to care about Palestine. No one had to teach me like uh, any like uh, history or like academic understandings. I'm I'm not an academic, obviously. Um, but the reason that I care about Palestine is because I see myself and I see my family in all of the videos and all of the stories that have come out. I, I cry every night before I go to sleep because I know that the mass graves that are being created by the IDF and the occupying forces there are the exact same forces that created the mass graves here in Canada. Because I know that the thousands and thousands of children that have died in Palestine are not different from the thousands and thousands of children here in Canada and the U.S. that have died at the hands of colonialism, at the hands of capitalism, at the hands of white supremacy. All of those things are the same, you know. It's been kind of said over and over today, but I very much think that Justin Trudeau has a love affair with Israel. I think that he really loves that country and really condones that violence because that's his violence. And he sees himself in the violence of Israel. I think that he sees Canada he sees the project of Canada. He sees the project of settler colonialism. He sees that future in Israel. Um, yeah. 
anyhow, I, that's kind of where I'm at right now. So thank you so much for giving me this time. Um, I guess I'll, I'll pass it to Pia Su. Dance be soon at Sigasa, Nipsigo Park, Utsunia, Gate, Equimus, Kutu, Sky again, Magotch, Nuigan. Hi, my name is Pia Su. Um, I'm a Samson, I'm a member of Samson Cree Nation, uh, currently based here in Edmonton, Alberta. Um, my, my work is, um, and I, I, th I think this kind of um, speaks for a lot of Indigenous people is, is based in our lived experiences um, and our families' lived experiences. Um, so a lot of my my work that I, I do is um, I'm, I'm a birth worker. Um, I do lactation support for the families in my community. Um, I do a lot of advocacy support for um people living with disabilities, but especially Indigenous people living with disabilities. Um, and kind of kind of piggybacking off what CM said, um, the we we understand as Indigenous people, we understand a framework of of genocide all too well. And um there's almost this like how would I how would I word that? Um this natural state of solidarity for people in Palestine, because what we have experienced here in Canada, there is a there's a shared lived experience of of what the people in Palestine um, are experiencing, and um, coming from a lens of of the work that I do, from a lens of reproductive care and reproductive justice, um, we can't fight for reproductive autonomy. Um, in our own home and in the lands that we occupy while ignoring the struggles of um, the people in Palestine for their own bodily autonomy, um, especially when the same government that is responsible for um, our reproductive oppressions and obstetrical violence committed against Indigenous people uh, is sponsoring the reproductive oppression of Palestinian people, Palestinian women, um, the you know, we see the, the maiming and the murdering um, of children and babies um, and the the um, um, sorry, my words are escaping me right now. Um, the targeted attacks of of hospitals um, and in especially in Gaza, the the bombardment and the blockades there are creating a mass disabling event, not even just physically, um, whether it be forced displacement, um, you know, the the continuous air raids, um, and, and so much more. The the colossal rates of individual and collective trauma creates all types of disabilities, ranging from mobility, psychiatric, sensory, um, and um, I think about it from like from a disabled perspective as personally, I I'm speaking for myself personally, but I know that this also um other disabled people can can relate to this, that um we know all too well uh the realities uh of being left behind. Um to to fend for ourselves, to our demise, um, to our unjust and premature deaths um even even in you know like small scale um situations such as having to leave a building due to a fire uh due to a fire many disabled people are left in their um in the spaces that they are currently in because they can't use an elevator um, and when you when you think about that on like a mass level, many disabled people, especially um, in situations like this, can't physically leave and are being left behind. Um, um, yeah, I, I I'm not too sure what else what else to say right now, but I, I wanted to speak on the work that I do and how that relates to where my um, my solidarity for the for Palestinian people. Um, 
because there is like there is a, a deep historical and political lived shared experience that we as indigenous people here and indigenous people in Palestine share. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Pisu. Um, we're going to pass it to Dusty, I guess. If Dusty wants to add anything or answer those questions. Yes, thank you, everybody, um, especially to Mays and those powerful words. Um, I want to echo Siam where it has to be Palestinian voices centered. There's no other way. Um, for future panels, I, I hope that more Palestinian voices can be present to show a perspective that none of us can understand. Even as Indigenous people here on Turtle Island, we can understand in survivors of genocide and an ongoing genocide, but we cannot feel the depth of what's going on right now. And as a father, and an artist, it's it's hard to even go day to day right now, um, knowing that there is something going on in this world that is so evil, and that there is media and there is people everywhere who are justifying this and its ugliness. And what connects me to Palestine is that those are our brothers and sisters, those are our family, those are our relations we are all connected due to this common enemy of colonization the colonial structures that exist that we fight against daily and that is something that will connect us for all time and we all pray to see the day where those structures fall where we can live in a blissful state and taking care of each other and that destruction of this of land and people doesn't happen anymore this is this is like everywhere and it's it's so heartbreaking to to witness it it's it's hard to find the right words it's hard to move in the right way and to know what to do um but what we have been taught time and time again is that we can't be silent we can't just let it go by. We have to do the little that we can to say something, to do something, to keep people accountable. Um, and I think as, as a designer or that have this brand or have a platform to do something, um, I've had to just step back from my work and try to say something for this because this is the only thing that's true. And as an artist, I've been taught that we can only flow and speak from the heart and what's present. And so I don't want to be fucking around in a capitalist game right now, trying to make money and do that when there's people suffering, where I can find a way to utilize my voice in small ways um, and hopefully make an impact. I have, a, I have a spot here. I go for lunch. That's, that's Palestinian family runs it. And a few months ago I walked in and he said to his son, he said, this is his land. And I, I won't forget how profound that felt to hear it from somebody. And then to start to see what was going on just a month or two later in Palestine, in his, in their homeland, was so heartbreaking. And so I've spent a lot of time with him. I, I go there every week for lunch to support the little that I can, their business, their family. And Every time I go in, he'll show me a new video. He he saw the video of of Bree and Anuk dancing at the front of the and he showed that video and he showed the video of the Palestinian dancing. He said, see, we dance the same. We have the same moves. And he was showing that unity and it's it's everywhere. This is this is who we are. We have to stand with our relations. We have to do anything that we can 
to fight against colonization and the ugliness that it creates. Uh, I call on all indigenous people to, to speak up, to raise your voice, um, to utilize any platforms you have to, to shake that and to be protective of it too. I've had to do it on my own platforms. Anytime I post something, there'll be people commenting, there'll be ugliness that comes and they just get deleted and blocked right away because we're not here for that. We're here for the movement of love and coming together and it's going to continue to take a lot of work. And I hope the world is watching all of this. And I'm happy that social media exists in the way that it can so that people can see the truth because mass media and everything still hides it all and still tries to hide behind that. And it's, it's just not acceptable. And to all of my pa Palestinian relations, I love you. I'm thinking of you and I'm praying for you and strength for for you and your family and and everything that's going on and um free 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 palestine every day all day thank you for allowing me to have a little voice today and thank you veronica for inviting me here um but yeah i would i would love to definitely in future ones hear more of a palestinian perspective um going forward and have that be centered because that's that's what matters. Hey, hey. Thank you, Dusty. And we're gonna send it to Mila. Hello, everybody. My name is Mila Nakeko. I'm Dene Dene Suthane from Pilikwa First Nations and Denen Day. Um, uh, I'm a, I'm an artist. And I'm a land-based arts educator, practitioner. I teach moose high tanning. And, <clears throat> and I'm here to talk about um, how, sorry. <laughs> mm. um, as a land practitioner, how, and indigenous, <sighs> the um, violence against, Palestine, their land, um, like the people, um, their future, their children, because um, as in, like we've experienced that in our in our in our nations here not too long ago. Um, our families were in residential school. I have an uncle that didn't make it home. And so why do I stand for um for Palestine? My solidarity is it's so like there's so much similarities um and we all know this so thank you for everybody who's shared and um yeah for myself i teach moose high tanning and uh those teachings um were lost to my family because of uh uh the colonial residential school system and I worked many years to reclaim that knowledge and to bring that back to my community and our families. And I've taught across Canada and many communities to revitalize this practice. And it took many, many, many years. Um, and through, uh, and that's where I, I find my strength and my sense myself and I ground myself in these practices. And, and through uh, that relationship that I have with my land and the in the land uh, across all of our nations, and seeing what's happening, um, and witnessing, uh, bear witness, bear witness to this genocide, um, uh, the dust in the in the that we see everybody's covered in dust, and there's so much um violence and 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 not having access to their water like rain isn't um they can't collect rainwater it's illegal in palestine to collect rainwater people's solar panels are being destroyed because they say that the sun um doesn't belong to palestine and so it's just 
really difficult to see how they're in their homelands. <laughs> they can't. Um, they don't have the means to use their traditional knowledge in their homelands to survive and to feed themselves. It's so difficult. Because of the connection we have here with our with our home. <laughs> and so yeah, so um violent on the land. Um I also wanted to talk about how it is about land. It's accessing land, and that's why they are here and they had worked so hard for hundreds of years to take our lands. It's for our resources to displace us. And that's what's happening in Israel. It's happening in Sudan. It's happening in Congo. Um, and we were witnessing it. We can see it. It's like the veil is coming off of how we're able to, like, uh, we're able to do this for hundreds of years. How we were not, we didn't know the truth because everything came through the educational system that we went through in this colonial state of Canada how all of that information came through the media and we know now like how it's skewed to these the, the colonial state like and, and so like in like so we all we know all of this like we we can see it we're, we're opening up and like for myself um I'm just up here in the north I'm in Den and Day I'm in, way in the north uh, um a moose high tanner um, for myself to be able to speak out and to use my small platform and to use my art to talk about um, what is going on is important because it's it's um, it's us against these huge corporate corporations and colonial governments, and they've as as it's been said before that like this apartheid and colonialism has been created and refined to this point where they are in Israel and what's happening through Canada and South Africa and New Zealand, Australia and the United States. Like these countries cannot cannot um uh, call for a ceasefire. They have to. They have to uh, support Israel because if they do, then they would have to recognize all the colonial atrocities that they have committed on our lands and on Indigenous lands in all of these countries throughout the history. And the unraveling that that would we do. So, yeah. So. Um, I have like using my art and <clears throat> to help right, like to help um educate and show other indigenous people in my communities and have com have com com have sorry have conversations with my chief and my council and my families and how it's important for us to be able to talk about these things um and how it relates to us in our struggle, my nation is still working towards self-government. They want us to sign a comprehensive agreement so that they can have all of, so they can push us into these smaller territories than what we have right now. So we're still in this fight for our lands. <laughs> so I I stand with I stand with Palestine, the people of Gaza, all the children, and I. And I'll continue to use my voice and my art for the people that are just trying to survive. So this is one of the pictures that I've been working on another one right now, but this is for the the babies of Gaza, um, the premature babies that were in the ICU and that were the power was um, disconnected. An Al Shifa hospital, and um, I drew a baby wrapped in a moss bag with with poppies of how we how we say our prayers 
I beaded a medallion in, in um, where I'm from. When we work on when we work on our art and our beadwork, when we work on had high tanning, we are consciously holding all of the people that we're thinking about in our minds as we sew, as we pray, as we meditate, and put all of our prayers into the works that we do. And so um, that's how, yeah. So thank you. I'm I'm so honored to to sit and to talk with everybody and to share how um, we are, we're all um, doing what we can um, for the people of Palestine. Masi. Thanks so much, Mila. Um, we, that's it for our panelists. I just wanna thank them all for their time and their expertise and just really echoing what Mila kind of wrapped up there was, it is really hard for us as Indigenous people to talk about this. And I think that's a very intentional, it's it, like it's very intentional that Canada doesn't want us talking about this like collectively, but in my networks, we've been talking a lot about this idea of blood memory that is activated right now as we witness this genocide. Um, we feel that so, so deeply, but they like, it cannot put us in this freeze mode you know, we, we love our people and our land so much. And we do this work because we love our people and our land so much. And we know Palestinians love their people and their land so much. And in our, in our original instructions as Indigenous people, there is a life that we all deserve. And for me, those original instructions affirm a free Palestine. And so, like, we need people shutting shit down. But we also need people making the art and talking to our elders and governing systems in prayer and in ceremony for a free Palestine. And these are violent, violent colonial war machines. And for Indigenous peoples, it is actually not that complicated for us to see this violence for what it is. So Palestinian people need to lead what this resistance looks like by any means necessary, but we know how to mobilize our own people. And CM said in a call earlier this week, and I, I just keep thinking about this kind of a sentence, but that um, we have a responsibility to activate our own homelands. Palestinians have told us what they need from us. We cannot just wait back them to organize everything themselves. Obviously, you know, they're fucking busy. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, I know for me, it's been a challenge kind of to feel or like to get my people and our people coming together for Palestine in material ways. And I think that's like Canada does not want us coming together for a free Palestine. Canada does not want us talking about land back in Palestine in the same conversation and in the same movements. They don't want us organizing together because we become unstoppable when we get on the ground together, when we condemn Canada. And lately I've been seeing now how there is a solidarity we need to build together every day, not just for a ceasefire, but until there is a free Palestine. So land back means free Palestine. And again, I just want to thank everybody. For hopping on the call. One other thing is we're going to link uh, Indigenous Peoples in Solidarity with Palestine sign on. I know there's like a lot of sign on letters circulating. We're not quite sure what to do with this, but right now we're just getting information and emails, contacts, stay connected, stay accountable to other Indigenous people who are organizing with Palestinians, organizing for Free Palestine. Um, and there's also going to be a link for some posters and flyers that were that were made in part like a like in a part of um this national coordinated Palestinian solidarity effort. Uh, yeah. So posters and flyers in like I think 14, 13 different languages. I can't really remember. But yeah. I want to thank everyone again for logging on. We're gonna wrap it up here. Yeah. Recording stopped.